Hi, I want to talk to you now about the moral calculus. That can be a scary term, sounds deeply mathematical, and there is some mathematics in it, but don't worry, there's not really any calculus in it. Instead, what this is, is a way of calculating the consequences of actions. That is to say, the value of those consequences, how good or bad they are. The moral calculus focuses on making some kind of judgment, ultimately, about what we ought to do and what acts are better than what. But how do we decide that? We look at an action, we look at its effects, its consequences, and then we judge the effects, if we're utilitarians, on happiness. But what do we say about these overall happiness levels? How do we calculate that? Here are two possible actions. We're thinking about what might result from them. We're thinking, well, how good or how bad are those things? How do we make those comparisons? How do we decide what's really the better action? Bentham proposes a method for doing that. It's a highly sophisticated method, and it's li it lies behind the method that businesses now routinely use, or that government agencies routinely use, to evaluate various kinds of proposals. It's called a cost-benefit analysis. And a lot of what you would learn in business school is really an application of Bentham's method to various kinds of problems. So Bentham is onto something here. It is a calculus, not in the sense that he's now giving you a scary new mathematical theory to learn of the kind that Newton and Leibniz proposed, but there is something really important that he's proposing. He's saying, here's how you analyze a problem. You think about the potential benefits. You think about the potential losses. You think about the probabilities of each. And then you put all of this together for various options you have and try to choose the best. And he gives you an outline for calculating all of that. Now, how you get from an actual real-world action to the numbers you put into these calculations is a complicated problem. We'll talk a bit about some of the problems. In a business setting, it's often just dollars, and it's a little bit easier to do. In life, it's not always just dollars, and so it's much harder to know exactly how to craft the inputs into this method as well as judge the outputs. But Bentham is giving us something here that I think is enormously valuable. So let's take a look at how exactly this sort of theory goes. Any kind of consequentialist theory has to have a theory of intrinsic good or basic good. A utilitarian, in particular, wants to either maximize or satisfy, that is to say, to say, I demand the best or I demand something good enough. Well, what do you mean, the best? Good enough. In what respect? You want to maximize or get enough of what exactly? Well, the utilitarian has to answer that question. You need a theory of the basic or intrinsic good. In other words, you're going to be saying that actions, or if you're a different kind of consequentialist, you'll be saying a rule or a policy, a motive, a character trait, a civilization. These kinds of things, well, are good to the extent that they have good consequences. And then you have to say what a good consequence is. Okay, you measure the value of these other things in terms of the value of consequences. How do you judge the value of consequences? That's a question of judging this basic good or this intrinsic good, the things that make consequences good or bad. Well, the moral good then on a conceptualization like that of any consequentialism or any utilitarianism is going to say, yes, the moral good consists in producing or having a tendency at least to produce the basic good. But what's the basic good? How do we judge the goodness or badness of consequences? Well, for Bentham and for Mill, the answer is happiness. The intrinsic good is happiness. But what is happiness? How do we evaluate that? There are different conceptions. We've seen Aristotle has a very broad, expansive conception of happiness, thinking of it in terms of eudaimonia, of living well, of flourishing or thriving. And so for Aristotle, it's something that includes all sorts of other intrinsic goods. There are many things that are intrinsically good, but happiness is the ultimate, the final intrinsic good. We always act for its sake and never for the sake of something else. What we're doing basically is always saying, yes, I want this for the sake of that, that for the sake of this, and so on, until we get to happiness. And then happiness is not sought for the sake of anything else. It's sought only for itself. Bentham and Mill have a different conception of happiness. For them, happiness is pleasure and the absence of pain. That's a view known as hedonism. Pleasure and pain are the only sources of value. Now, why do they think this? At first glance, and a lot of modern philosophers look at this and think, hmm, that seems awfully one-dimensional or maybe two-dimensional. <coughs> oh, 
Oh, forgive me. Pleasure and pain, that seems like two dimensions. Maybe, maybe they're on one dimension. But whatever we say about that, it looks like this is a kind of theory that isn't very complex. Why is happiness just pleasure in the absence of pain? Why aren't all sorts of other things included in it that Aristotle would have included as part of flourishing or thriving? After all, we might think, look, to be happy is not just to feel pleasure, it's not just not to feel pain. It's a matter of all sorts of other more complex states of mind. Having a sense of achievement, for example, having a sense of self-respect, feeling like I have some appreciation from others, some degree of esteem from other people. It might involve a sense of, well, having done the right thing in the past, being the right kind of person, having virtues, and so on. Aristotle would have thought it encompasses all of those things. Here, that all gets reduced to pleasure and pain. But it's not a trivial thing, and neither is it quite as reductive as it first sounds. Bentham has an entire chapter where he outlines different kinds of pleasures and pains, and each of the families of pleasures and pains has many different subkinds. So he has in mind many of the things Aristotle has in mind, just he calls them pleasures and pains. But there's something else going on too. Bentham and Mill are empiricists. They think that all of our ideas come from experience. They're basically followers of Hume, and they say all my ideas originate in impressions. But wait a minute, there's something really special about morality. It's normative. It is prescriptive. It is evaluative. I'm not just saying how the world is. I'm saying how it ought to be. And how do I have an experience of that? It's not like I experience how the world ought to be. I see it as it is. And so we've got this problem that Hume points out. We've got a gap between is and ought, between is this way or is that way, and that is good or is bad. And how do we bridge that gap? How do we get from one to the other? Of course, Hume has his own views on that. But for Bentham and Mill, it's like, this is scary. If we're really to approach morality and politics and law and all sorts of other normative areas in a way that exhibits a scientific spirit and takes them seriously and takes them as rational and not just as something that involves sentiment or feeling the way Hume does, we're going to have to say something about what the connection between the is and the ought is, between the is this way, that way, and is good or is bad. We've got to, in some way, explain the origin of our idea of better and worse, of good and bad, of ought and ought not. How on earth are we going to do that? Well, if we're empiricists, we think we've got to find an impression. We've got to find a perception or an experience that is in some way normative, that's evaluative, that doesn't just describe things, but that pushes us back or that leads us toward them. And they both say, what is that kind of thing? Where do I have an experience where it's not just mm, red, blue, square, triangular, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but then like, no, no, or yeah. <laughs> okay? They say pleasure and pain are like that. Okay? You take even a small child. You show them this, show them that. Yeah, maybe, maybe they're interested, maybe they're not, and so on. But then slap them. They're like, ah! Okay? They don't like it. And it immediately prompts this reaction. It has this effect on action. This pleasure does the same thing. Give the baby something that tastes really, really good. They want more. I was present when the, uh, the son of a friend of mine tasted salsa for the first time at a Mexican restaurant. And suddenly it was like, more, more salsa. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah, I mean, you give somebody something good, they want more of it. There is this immediate normative impact. It has an impact on desires, on motivations, on, you might say, pulling someone toward or pushing them away from something. And that's not purely descriptive. So Bentham and Mill say that is a kind of perception that actually seems to bridge the gap between is and ought. Pain, pleasure, they actually attract or repel us in a way that other impressions don't. So those are, you might say, distinctively normative impressions. And that's why they take this as a foundation. They see it as the only foundation that is really fully consistent with empiricism. So with that Humean foundation in the background, they're saying, what else could it be? Maybe there are other states of mind, but really when they, have in, when they talk about pleasure and pain, they mean any state of mind that attracts us to something, any state of mind that repels us from something. And so those are the origins of our feelings of ought, ought not, good, bad, better, worse, etc. Now, 
Bentham, of course, says, I want you to be clear <laughs> about what I intend here. This is not a theory that promotes selfishness. We've got to consider not just ourselves, but everyone affected by the action. And in that sense, we have to think about the effects on the entire community. But don't get misled by that. By talking about the entire community, I don't mean anything mystical or hard to define. I just mean making the people in that community happier. The effect on the community is just the sum of the effects on the members. And so promoting the happiness of the community is just promoting the happiness of the people in the community. There's nothing else, nothing over and above that. Well, how do I go about making a decision then? I have to make some judgment about the tendency of this action to improve or to detract from the happiness of that entire community. And in evaluating the effect on the community, I look at the effect on the members of that community. There's nothing else to look at. So how do I go about doing it? Well, as you can see here, it's actually a bit complicated. I have to identify the options facing us in the decision. Then I have to identify who might be affected. Within business ethics, there's a term now for that, but I think it's a useful term to bring back into Bentham and Mill. The people who are affected, or might be affected by the action, are called the stakeholders. So let's just refer to them as stakeholders. It might be the entire community, but maybe the stakeholder is just me. Nobody cares what I do about this. Or maybe it is you know, a very small set of people. That's fine. We only really have to worry about the stakeholders. In principle, we have to worry about, worry about the entire community. But the fact is that most of the time, we're affecting only a few people. Then we identify the possible outcomes. How likely are these outcomes? How might they affect each of those stakeholders? We calculate for each of the options and each of those possible outcomes the expected gains and losses for each stakeholder. So we look at what would happen under each of those possible outcomes to that stakeholder. We judge the effect on their happiness. Then we think, what's the probability of that one happening? And we put all of those together to judge the expected effect. Okay, so that, in that includes the effects that we anticipate for each of those possible outcomes. Then we ex add all those expected gains and expected losses together. We take the difference. And that yields the expected gain or loss. Now for all the stakeholders together, for the entire community, for that option. And then we rank the options by their expected results. So it is something of a complicated procedure. And I, one way to think about it is to think about this list, but maybe another way that's clearer is to think about filling in a balance sheet a spreadsheet like this, okay? First, we identify the people who might be affected by our action. And I've listed those here as A through Z. And then we identify the options. It doesn't matter in which order we do those, really, I suppose. But identifying the options first might make it easier to be sure we've got all the people who might be affected. And then once we've done that, we say, okay, for each of those options, I have to prepare a spreadsheet like this and figure out what the total expected effects on the community are. So for each person, let's take A, the very first row there. I have to say, what are the expected pleasures for A? Now it's complicated because I'm thinking, okay, if I do this action, what's gonna happen? Let's say it's an action of spinning the roulette wheel. <laughs> well, what might happen? Hmm, I guess any of those outcomes are possible. Any of those things might come up. And let's say that person A has placed a bet on red. Well, what happens if it lands red? Aha, A wins. I have put that in the chart. But then what happens if A loses? I have to put that in the chart too. What are the odds of A winning? Well, I don't know, it depends on the roulette wheel, but maybe one out of 33 or something. Anyway, whatever it is, I have to figure out then what the expected gain is from this, what the expected loss would be, and take the difference. And I can take the difference now, or I can wait and add them all up and take the difference at the end. It doesn't really matter. If I take the difference now and subtract the expected pains from the expected pleasures, then what I've got is the expected effects on person A. But then I do it for B, and then I do it for C and D and so on, all the way down the list of everybody affected. And then I add all of this up. So I add all of the pleasures expected up, and that becomes a total of expected pleasures for the entire community, for all the stakeholders taken together. There, I've represented that as P. Then I do the same for the expected losses. That gives me L, the expected losses for the entire community. 
And then I take P minus L to get the balance. The difference between those two, that gives me the balance of pleasure over pain for the entire community. And of course, it might end up being negative. It could turn out that, yeah, the expected result here is actually going to promote the unhappiness of the community. I can, of course, do it by taking the difference for each individual person and adding up all those differences. It better add up to the same number. I'll get B, the balance of pleasure over pain for the entire community. Now, I do that calculation for every single option that I have. And then I take those Bs and I put them on the scale. I say, all right, which is the best? Which is the next best? And so on. And I arrange my options according to that scale, according to that measure, B. B now tells me for each option where it goes on the scale. And then I make a judgment about what to do. So the moral calculus tells me, here's how you evaluate your various options. What it does is give me a method for making a decision. I take each option, I do all of this, I come up with the expected effect on the happiness of the community, in B, there, the, the quantity, there's the balance of pleasure over the pain, over pain for all the stakeholders on that option. Then I compare it to the other options. Well, here's an example of this kind of calculation. These are an example of the odds on one of the games in the Texas lottery system. So suppose you think about playing this game. Well, you can look at these various things and I don't actually know how to play this game. I'm sort of confused about it, so it's complicated. And actually, lotteries are often complicated. If you want to figure out your actual odds and what the expected value of playing is. Um, I'll tell you this, though. It's going to come out negative for you. And why do I say that? Because they have these lotteries to raise money. <laughs> it's going to make money for the casino, or for, in this case, for the state of Texas. So guess what? State of Texas is going to win and you're going to lose. Um, that doesn't mean you might not actually win the lottery. You might, okay? You might end up being, through an example of moral luck, lucky and the thing that has a bad tendency might turn out to have a good result in your case. But the tendency is going to be bad. And you can see something of why by just looking quickly at this chart. Take a look at that top row. The prize is a quarter million dollars, $250,000. The odds of winning that, one in 2.7 million. Well, what's your expected payoff for putting a dollar and assuming that's going to happen? It's 250,000 over 2.7 million. Ooh, that's what? About nine cents. <laughs> okay, so expected return on your dollar, about nine cents. Your expected loss playing that is about a 91 cent loss for each dollar. Hmm, that doesn't sound too good. What about that eight down there in the middle of the chart, or the four? Well, the prize is only $2, but hey, you got a one in 11 shot. So you lose, you lose your dollar. You win, you gain $2, but you've only got a one in 11 shot to do that. So actually expected value for you of putting down that dollar? Hmm, you're, well, the expected payout would be something like two over 11 or 18 cents. So in general, you might expect that you're going to lose 72 cents. Not a very good play. Well, anyway, lotteries are generally like that. Most games of chance are like that. Now, I do have some friends who gamble and go to Vegas and do very well, but they play poker or they play blackjack or other games that are not strictly luck. Strictly luck, there's no way to get good at playing the lottery. You can get good at playing blackjack or playing poker. But um, at this kind of game, there's no skill. And so it's a losing bet. So Bentham and Miller are going to tell you, look, don't do it. Now, of course, you might be thinking of not just yourself. After all, as a utilitarian, you have to think about all the state stakeholders. So you think, well, look, hey, I might win, probably won't. But I want to support education in Texas, so I'm happy to have my money go there anyway. I think that's for the greater good, so I'm happy to do it. Well, OK. That's a reason. And indeed, you might see what's happening to the lottery money, and you might think that's a really good thing. And so, actually, I think it is morally a good thing to play the lottery. Yeah, I'm not going to win, so my entry on that table is not going to be a positive one. But on the other hand, other people's entries might be, because the state is going to get the money, and if the state does good things with it and educates children and does this thing and that thing, then I'll say, actually, for a lot of other people, this is a positive thing. 
So I don't feel too bad about that. My entry is what I'm calculating when I'm judging the expected effects on me. Okay, I might lose 72 cents, but that means other people gain 72 cents, and what are the effects of that? And so maybe in the end I say, you know, this is a good thing to do. So I don't mean to say it's never a good thing from a moral point of view to do such a thing, but it's never a good thing considering just your own welfare for prudence to do it if no skill is involved. Now the point here is really to say this kind of calculation that we just went through, a very simple case of just thinking about one line on such a table, that's the kind of thing you do in doing the moral calculus. You just do it for every single person giving the, given the effect on that option of everybody involved and you do all of those calculations. So the moral calculus tells you to go through and not just do that for yourself, let's say you're person A, but to do it for every other stakeholder, every other person who might be affected, and then add all of that up. It's going to be complicated, and then you have to do that for every single option. Once you've done it, we come back to this problem. You've got the options listed, and then it's a question of, well, now what do I do? <laughs> well, presumably you want to choose one of the best ones, but do you have to do the absolute best one? On some versions of the theory, yes. But what about those others that are almost as good? Can you choose one of those? Well, maybe, okay? Maybe those are okay too. So we're going to have to specify in our theory what to do once we've got that scale. And there are different ways of doing that. And my own view is, look, there's no one right answer to that question. With respect to some kinds of things, we actually demand the best. With respect to other kinds of things, we say good enough is okay. And so it's gonna depend a lot, in my view, on the context we're not going to be able to give one answer to that question for every kind of problem and every kind of issue. Sometimes we really want the best and sometimes we don't. Well, anyway, there are various issues that one would have to deal with to really put this into practice and also, you might say, that present some theoretical problems. I don't want to go into these in detail. If we were really doing a course where we we're doing large parts of the course on consequentialism, we would. But here's the general thought. There are different kinds of problems we have when we think about comparing effects. For example, pleasures and pains. Do they really belong on the same scale? Is a pain something like just a negative pleasure? What do we do about the fact that sometimes pains and pleasures seem to be mixed in a certain way? Let's say we're talking about a kind of pleasure that is involved in athletic activity. Yeah, exercising some and you know playing a game at a certain level, that, that can be pleasurable. But there's a different kind of experience you have if you're really pushing yourself, really playing hard, really going into the gym and lifting heavy weights. It might be that you're enjoying it the most and getting the most pleasure out of it when you're actually on the edge of pain. There's a little bit of pain mixed in with the pleasure. And other things might be like that too. A sense of achievement might be much greater if it's been a really difficult thing and there were lots of pains of various kinds involved in achieving that. It didn't come easily. And so you might think, yeah, sometimes pleasures and pains are wrapped up together in a way that can one dimension really fully capture. So that's an issue that we have to think about carefully. Maybe we shouldn't have one scale. Maybe there are actually something like two scales here. And yeah, the pain scale is mostly negative, but it can overlap the positive. And anyway, I'm not sure what the right picture is, but it's not obvious that pleasures and pains relate just as positive and negative values of one thing. There are also problems about the near and long-term pleasures and pains. Sometimes this is explained in business in terms of something called a discount rate. I would rather have a pleasure today than a pleasure a week from now. I'd rather get a dollar today than a dollar a week from now. I would rather have to face a pain a year from now than face it today. And so you might say, look, in general, the future discounts certain values of these things. Um, we would prefer the near to the long-term but sometimes we want to sacrifice the near term for the long term. So how do we make those comparisons? How do we judge pleasures today and pleasures tomorrow or next year? And the same for pains. Presumably there is some way of comparing these. And in the theory of finance, there are complicated ways of doing this when it's money that we have in, at stake. But we need the equivalent of a financial theory for other kinds of pleasures and pains. And we're going to have to make assumptions about that. The assumptions we make will make a big moral difference. Now that's not to say that this is an argument against the theory. The utilitarian will say, yeah, that's an important part of morality. You think, just how much sacrifice should I be making in the present for the sake of the future? Well, it's a good question. How much should I be saving right now in order to protect the future? 
sacrificing present happiness for the sake of future happiness? It's not an easy question to answer, and it's something that is really a fundamental part of moral thinking, whether we're talking about saving money or whether we're talking about developing skills or doing all sorts of things, deferring gratification for a variety of purposes. Making interpersonal comparisons is really hard. How do I judge the relative importance of my pleasures as against your pleasures? Well, Bentham says, hey, each counts for one, and no one counts for more than one, so actually we're all equal. But wait a minute, I don't, you know, how do we evaluate just how much pleasure you're going to get out of this as opposed to me, or how much pain two different people are in? Let's say, and by the way, this is a problem really faced in medicine, so it's not an artificial problem involving this problem. Somebody comes into the hospital, let's say, and is complaining about a pain. They'll give that person a chart and say, well, on a chart of, you know, 0 to 10, tell me how severe this pain is. And they're hoping that the person can put this on a scale, but they face the same kind of problem of assigning a number to something that isn't really numeric. Um, it isn't like dollars where I can count them. It's like oh, pains. I can't just count them, right? And so I've got to put myself on this scale, but how do I do that? Is this a 2? Is this a 4? Is this a 5? Is this a 7? I don't know. And they hope that people do this in a similar way. But if one person is stoic and says, well, this is a 7, and somebody else would be saying, this is horrible, this is a nine. You know, how do we make the judgment about who's actually right and how much pain that person is really feeling? We do have the sense that some people are more sensitive to pain than others, but how do we make that precise? There's another kind of problem, I think, about these interpersonal comparisons. Some people have a very even sort of personality. They don't get terribly happy or terribly unhappy about things. They're very level-headed. Something good happens, they're like, yeah. Something bad happens, and like, no. Oh. You know, whereas somebody else, they're happy and it's like, yeah! Somebody else, they're sad, no! <laughs> and how do we make judgments about those two things, right? I mean, in a certain sense, this person is always within this range. That person's within a much greater range. Well, if we just add up the numbers and assume we can do that fairly, it's going to look like this person matters a lot more than that person. And that seems bizarre. After all, what if this person's just a whiny crybaby? <laughs> we don't want the crybabies to control the outcome of our moral decision making. But on the other hand, often in decisions we do this. You know, a, a group of friends are heading out to lunch and they say, well, where do you want to go? And several people say, oh, I don't care. And they really don't. I mean, it's not going to make a big difference to them. And somebody else says, oh, I really want to go to this place. The others may well say, all right. Cool, we'll go to that place, we don't care. And it seems reasonable then to let that person's strong desire dominate the group. So sometimes, in short, we want to say, actually, when this is going on, it's a much greater range, we should take that into account. And that person's really most affected and most cares, so good, we sh they should play a, bit of a, a bigger role in the decision. But sometimes we want to say, look, we shouldn't encourage <laughs> decision making that actually takes the people who are the loudest, the squeakiest wheels, and them get all the grease. So there's a complicated issue there that we have to sort out. But again, the utilitarian will say, well, it's a real issue. I agree with you, it's an issue we have to sort out, but it's a real moral problem. It's not something we say, ah, there's an argument against the utilitarian theory. No, it really is a, a problem in collective decision making. Some people are going to scream a lot louder if they get unhappy. How much do we take that into account in our decision making? It's a real thing we have to face. There are a few other issues. We have to figure out somehow the intensities. It's like assigning the numbers to those pains. And that's a hard thing to do. I think Bentham imagines that eventually we'll get to the point in neurophysiology where we could hook something up to your brain to determine how much pleasure or pain you're experiencing. But short of that, it seems like it's going to be hard to come up with the numbers. And finally, there's a problem about the different kinds of pleasures. But that's important enough that I'm going to talk about that in a separate video. It's worth more extended discussion. Well, I hope I've given you the feel for Bentham's overall theory, how he wants us to go about making moral decisions. He thinks this is the best and most rational possible method. And so we're going to not only see how we might actually try to extend it in certain ways, but then we're going to take some hard conflict cases and try to apply it.